Today, so what I'm going to focus uh, about is how women's life in uh, armed conflict areas gets affected, and out of that, how they also not remain only as a victim, but as a survivor, and not only as a survivor, but how they become change agents, despite of the difficulties and everything that they have to face in life. Um, so, today my title is Against All Odds, Naga Women's Work to Transform Conflict and Peel Peace During Seven Decades of Naga India Conflict. And here when we talk about Nagas, uh, it won't be only from the India side, we will include Nagas from the Perma side as well. Uh, before going into uh, much details, I want to briefly show us a map on who are the Nagas and where are they located and situated. Here you can see um, the eastern Nagaland that is bordered by Burma and on the other side uh, it's the Indian and then the Tibet, China and Bangladesh below so and above it. So the Nagas location itself is very interesting in a way because it goes more towards East Asia rather than South Asia. Um, and here we can see the line of uh, the red and the green itself. The other side goes towards Burma and on the left side is the border that comes towards India side. So the Nagas how the Nagas got divided, it began from colonialism. Um, when the British drew the lines, they didn't consult the Nagas at all. They just came in and drew the borders according to, you know, they were sitting at the capital and they said, oh, these are just illiterate and ignorant people, so we can do anything we want. So that's how they drew the borders right in between and Nagas got separated uh, between Burma and India. Uh, so I want to give a brief highlight on what who are Nagas and how did the conflict came about and how uh, how the conflict with the, from the British times to how it transitioned into India. The Nagas, uh, my, uh, the Nagas forefathers were our traditions and cultures depends a lot on oral traditions. We do not have any written scripts or any written documents that existed. So most of our life stories and histories, it was we followed oral kinds of traditions um, which played a negative role in future because we didn't have any of the records that could have had an evidence kind of based on what you know the, the Nagas could advocate for their rights. Um, it was in 1832 the first time British uh, came to invade the Nagas land. Before that British tried many times to pass through the land of the Nagas to have a passage for the trade purpose between India and Burma, but somehow they could not succeed. But it was in 1832, um, the Nagas lost the battle and that's how the British began invading the land of the Nagas. And from then on, from 1832 onwards, uh, British started administrating part of the land of the Nagas that was the time when British was occupying India and Burma as well. And they merged everything together, like, you know, as like one for them. <laughs> their colonizers were like, uh, co the colonies that they tried to colonize, they just club everybody as one, and that's how they were ruling. So, um, um, in 1929, uh, when the Indian government was trying to overthrow the um, British government, the Nagas also helped them in resisting against, uh, in withdrawing the British government from uh, India and on the Perma side as well. So when, um, in 1929, the Nagas formed a youth club who also went to help in the First World War and uh, the Nagas uh, who went to help uh, in the First World War, who got an exposure to the outside world, came back and some of the youths formed a youth club called the Naga Club and this were mainly sort of the male um, youths that went to help in fighting war. They came back and formed a club and they said, okay, this is the club that will promote and advocate for the rights of the Nagas. So here, um, when the British was about to withdraw from uh, India and Burma, 
the Nagas uh, the Nagas went to British and said when you leave India or Burma we want to be independent we do not want to be uh, either with any uh, part of the group we want to be independent as we were before so when British was about to withdraw from the land of India and Burma, Nagas declared their independence on August 14, 1947, before India declared their independence. And from here, uh, in 1947, the Na uh, India and Pakistan also got separated, so the issue got all the more complicated. And for India now, it's the time to build the country, to go through the process of nation building. And suddenly when it got divided, you know, they have to make it a bigger nation with an inclusion of all. So that's how for the Indian government, it was the palm tree that matters and the land that had to be, you know, um, governed together. And on the Naga side, uh, they they wanted to be independent from either Burma or from India. And when these negotiations uh, were going back and forth, and a few of the Naga leaders, they met Mahatma Gandhi and said, we, don't, we want to be independent and we do not want to be a part of either Burma or India. And Mahatma Gandhi said, yes, um, we would like you to live with us, but if that's your will, um, you know, we would allow you to be independent, but we will live peacefully with each other. So then, uh, with, I think, Mahatma, uh, with Mahatma Gandhi's blessings, that's how Naga's uh, independence declaration came about. But after, before they could see through it, Mahatma Gandhi was killed. So that's how it got all the more complicated, and the next leadership that came about they did not uh, support the view of Mahatma Gandhi towards the Naga, so that's how it got all the more complicated. So when all these negotiations were going back and forth, um, it was claimed that few of the Naga, it was the misguided few leaders that wants to separate away from India or from the Perma side. So the Nagas uh, conducted a plebiscite to show to the leaders that whether it is only the few misguided group or it's the population that wants to be independent. And when they held this election, um, this plebiscite, 99.9% .9 voted for independence. And they submitted this memorandum to the Indian government and to the Perma side. And they said they even sent to the UN, but we don't know whether it ever reached there. <laughs> this is the question, yeah. So um, when this... Uh, when they conducted the plebiscite, uh, plebiscite and when they all declared um, for independence, Nagas hoisted a flag like for an independence declaration in each of the households. So the Indian leaders, uh, along with uh, Newin from Burma, they came to the land of the Nagas to negotiate, to talk about this. But Nagas uh, did not give in. They said if it's to uh, live to, if the negotiation is to live together, then we are not going to, um, uh, it was from both sides, the Indian government leaders and the, when Nevin, uh, the that time that was the leader of the Burma, when they came, um, the Nagas wanted to submit a memorandum to them that, okay, now we are independent, but they were not allowed to submit. So there were uh, sort of miscommunication, it wasn't a miscommunication, they uh, re both of them, they very much wanted the, the Nagas to be either part of them, you know. So there was um, a sort of disagreement between the three groups. So here, uh, what happened was after this, um, Nagas started using the nonviolence movement strategy of Mahatma Gandhi. <laughs> so they uh, they started civil disobedience movement. They used various non-violent strategy to make it work, but somehow it did not. And by 1956, um, 100,000 Indian soldiers were sent to the borders of the Nagas, and that's how they started to occupy the land of the Nagas. And when the occupation began, the borders were basically sealed. And here, um, Many of the, when the military were sent in, uh, most of the le uh, youth leaders that were tr trying to uh, negotiate, uh, negotiate for the independence of the Nagas, they 
fled to the jungle because basically when the militaries came they started looking for them so that's how the movement came about it was it didn't start with the having cons when I uh, hear stories of what the forefathers say, it was very silly in a way. They hold sticks and went to the jungle. So I asked them, so do you think holding a stick will make a difference? And they were like, we just had to flee because we knew that if we were caught, we didn't know what would happen. So that's how it started initially, like going to the jungle holding sticks because Nagas did not possess guns. They, what they had is like spears and dows, you know, so. Uh, by 1958, uh, what happened was uh, when all this um, discontentment were going on, uh, the Indian government passed a legislation called Armed Forces Special Powers Act in 1958, and under this act, the military had the uh, power over everything in terms of governance, in terms of uh, the structure. So under this. Um, after this law, people do not have uh, any rights. Uh, they could not do anything uh, in their own way. And here, um, when all this, the military occupation and when the uh, legislation started, the, the Naga um, groups who went underground, they started um, passing the border of Burma and they went to seek help from China, which was a big mistake, I should say. <laughs> that made it all the more complicated. And their idea was, okay, since um, I I India is not listening to us, let's seek help from the neighbors. And obviously I should say that China also tried to use to their advantage. Yeah. So it got all the more complicated from holding sticks to now the yeah the border crossing over and you know the influence of many things came about and um, from 1950s to 1970s um, the land of the Nagas on the India side itself it got divided and merged within four states so basically um, in four states that there are other communities as well uh, that lives so that's how the ethnic conflict started and it was sort of um, easier to administer uh, when it's like a big group of people to administer yeah so the land division and everything happened and um, in 19 so from 50s to till uh, till 80 lots of violation took place human rights violation and since the borders were sealed, even the mainstream activists, like from the India side, human rights activists, even if they want to come in and help, they were not allowed to. Because it was not only the, uh, even the India itself, we have lots of scholars and activists who also cares about the issue that goes on. So um, since the border was sealed, basically uh, people could not come and go easily. And there, is, there was a restricted pass. So everybody has to go through the permission of the government. And when this conflict uh, began, I forgot to mention, actually from the British colonialism times, um, a lot of American Baptist missionaries came in. It wasn't only Baptist. So um, they started um, preaching Christianity to the Nagas, and that's how many got converted into Christianity. and. It somehow uh, spoiled the culture of the local itself as well, but the good thing that came about is education. The missionaries brought education to the people, so that's how uh, a lot of the Nagas get educated. But when the border was uh, began sealing in 1950s, all the foreigners were uh, driven out of the region and nobody was allowed to enter anymore. So here, um, from 1950s to 70s, uh, major, major human rights violation took place and uh, I'm going to show a brief video to, to make you understand but better how conflict got so intense. So here, this was how the villagers were uh, treated under the military occupation. They were given rations, everything, but not allowed to go to their field. That was grouping. It was terrible for a villager to stay idly there, even though You can see the women like holding by the military. Yeah. But that was uh, as soon as center took over. Uh, that was uh, 
Tribuna. But it was done by the army in between the year 55 and 57. So this was basically villagers were put in a sort of a concentration kind of camp. And you can see a man hanging upside down there. So this began in 50s to yeah, 70s time. ที่ก่อนละกี่ปอเฮกะจิติชาตาฮะบอเรฟุสันเดนจาปารนานอรนากะปีเทวามุกะบางนุรีฟุตอรีชานุปามิเชอิสิกะจิติโอนนอโบละ
So uh, the videos that I showed was just try um, to show an example of how the women uh, suffered through the military occupation in the conflict. And it was uh, almost 90% of the population and the families that suffered through. And the videos that I showed uh, to you was mostly the villagers. Like when all these conflicts uh, happen, it's the rural areas and the interior places where um, government officials or where people could not go in. That's the area where they were targeted the most. And as you can see from the story, where there, every time the nationalist group and in the region itself there are many groups. So when there is an ambush uh, that takes place between the military or them, the target is always towards the civilians. And so civilians are the ones that face uh, and peer the conflict all the more. Here, um, I really wanted to show this video, but it's not working. Um, in this conflict, how it uh, had an impact on women. For me, for myself, um, when I had to grow up from 80s, what I see was violence and conflict and killings. and. I could not imagine a life beyond the boundary of the village and that there is an outside world out there, you know. So it wasn't just me, it was all the young girls and all the women that lived through the conflict, they experienced the same. And whenever we go to the schools, like, uh, we'll be fearing, like, what's going to happen the next day. And I remember a time when the even the police itself got fed up with the way the military was functioning at that time. So they started, um, I remember a time when they had to start firing with each other. And that happened just above the roof of my house. And I remember bullets flying over the roof. And that time I was uh, very young in school and we were just hiding under the bed. When I look back now, wow, how, how was it that, you know, I just had to stay there at that house, but I think I didn't have an option and it wasn't just me, it was almost all the young girls and all the women that were there, they had to face it because there was no way to escape. And a, w a woman here mentioned that she gave birth in jungle. Uh, even my mom, she gave birth to one of my brother in the jungle uh, fleeing from army. So that wasn't just uh, one woman's story. It was almost everybody, almost uh, in, how do I say, maybe around almost 50%, I should say, f uh, for those who live through like from 50s, 60s, and 70s, almost everybody suffered. So in these times, what they do when the military comes in, villagers, they did not know how to speak the language as well to the you know, military. So what they do is they always had to flee because they didn't know what's going to happen to them. Uh, and oftentimes, um, rape and assault, uh, all such incidences takes place. And there was a time in um, 19 late 70s when there was uh, an ambush by the Naga nationalist group towards the camp of the uh, Indian military. An attack took place, so there was a fighting in between both of them, but out of that, the retaliation, 
the 30 villages of the Nagas were sealed by the military and they started torturing the people. So I met, uh, there were five women who gave birth in concentration camps at the time and I got to meet one of the women there who gave birth. And in this, um, some of the children died also of starvation because they were kept uh, in the crown for so long without giving food or shelter and most of the women were also used to do a kind of border like um, they had to help them out because when the military had to occupy 30 villages uh, they need shelter uh, so basically what they took they took away the um, buildings and roofs of the villagers itself and they built their own shelter so that was quite an experience uh, that I heard and here um, whenever there is an anger bit or the relationship of the Indian military or the nationalist group were not going right the oftentimes the victims and the retaliation has been towards the civilians because when they are not able to catch them it was the civilians that had to face it um, so in this um, In this conflict, um, almost 90% of the population uh, got affected and almost everybody, either it's their relative or their own family, they lost somebody in their family and that's how I lost one of my eldest brother in conflict. Um, and that's not just my family, it's like almost uh, everybody uh, because even if they did not lose their immediate family, they lose their relative. So that's how... Um, why I'm sharing all of this is like how it's not only with the Nagas but there are so many conflict affected in the regions all over the world and how in this conflict we have to be very careful of the security itself because at times uh, in order uh, in trying to protect the border and the regions uh, oftentimes it doesn't help the people that lives at the margins at the border areas it happens at the cost of the people that lives there so I think we also have to be careful on the laws and policies that often gets framed in the uh, country itself here um, now I'm going to move towards the other direction out of all the sufferings that Naka women went through uh, how they transition and how they became the change agents I am using um, so the Nagas from 1950s uh, to till 19 90s they suffered through it and in 1997 the declaration of the ceasefire happened so that's since then on the peace talks have started taking place and all the violence that goes on has tremendously reduced though the talks are going back and forth and we don't know what the solutions will be uh, so here I'm using Sandra Sheldon's model on conflict um, here there are three levels that gets affected uh, to women. At the structural or macro level, the country's legislations and laws that do not work in favor of women, uh, which goes against um, instead of protecting them. And so here mainly I'm highlighting the law of Armed Forces Special Powers Act, a legislation that passed in the country. When such legislations and laws are passed, I think we need to be very careful how that law itself will have an impact on women and this totally uh, went against women. And when these laws were passed, it was basically to protect the government, but it, it became a failure of the system itself to protect the lives of the people that lives on the margins. And here at the traditional or cultural level, um, women were again not at all uh, considered in decision making or in policy making and there was no space for women to even uh, come about and play the leadership roles and so basically their needs, their concerns, everything was excluded. I definitely feel that if the Indian government had a women's group <laughs> that were there in the framing of the legislation itself, maybe it would have been more sensitive, you know. it was obviously like all men sitting at the table and hey let's go and get the, uh, the group out there so I I felt like uh, there is uh, always a difference when there is a women's presence there but I'm sure I don't think at that time in 50s when the laws were framed that the 
women would have been there to frame the law. Uh, so at the micro level, um, women became, their victimization became invisible and they were basically the ones that had to suffer through in everything. So here, how I came about with all these findings and the studies that I'm going to present is uh, in 2006, I, w I went back uh, to the region of the conflict-affected areas and trying to understand how this conflict has had an impact on the lives of the women. So um, I focused on the widows that has lost their husbands in conflict and mothers who lost their sons. This will be basically mostly focusing on uh, the mothers whose sons were killed in uh, during the shootings or when the villagers were tortured or even those who has gone to join movements and who were killed in the process. And the third uh, that I focused was on the rape victims uh, of the conflict and the survivors of the conflict itself. And the four criteria was uh, women that gave birth in concentration camps. And the other group was on the women nationalist groups, why they had to join the movements and what was it that drove them to go and join such a movement and vote for the rights of the people. So that was another group. And the last group, this is the group that I'm going to shift my focus on is the Naga women's activists that emerged from all of the sufferings they went through from 50s to 70s. Here, um, Naga women's group, um, from 50s to 70s, they were basically invincible. Um, they were not able to come out and def uh, protect themselves or defend for their rights, but after suffering through three decades, it made them emerge. They said, okay, we are tired of our life and we are tired of our families, our relatives getting killed and every time having no uh, power to take care of our life itself. So in 1970s, the Naga women's group started emerging. They started forming groups here and there, and the association started emerging. And this, I would uh, say that all the uh, sufferings that they went through made them realize the need to form a group to protect and defend uh, themselves. Because all of them knew that, uh, and they knew that someday or the other, um, even if they were not raped, even if they were not tortured, it was, it, the situation itself has become very close to their door itself that they had to come out and protect. So from 1975, um, there was the first women's association that was formed called uh, Tankul Naga Women's Group. And this was the group that um, came about to start protecting the villagers and the women's, uh, uh, if the conflict, if the Ampu shockers and if they are trying to torture the villagers, they became the cards of the villagers. So here, when the systems and everything uh, failed to protect um, the community or the women or the children itself, women emerged. And when I uh, spoke with them, I asked, uh, were you scared? I mean, what was it that when you knew that you could be assaulted, you could be raped or anything could happen to you, what was it that, that made you come about like that? And they said, we didn't care about our lives anymore. What they told me was, even if I'm killed, even if I'm assaulted, fine, I will sacrifice my body to protect the community because we don't want to see for this for the future generation anymore. So that's how they emerge and they realize the importance of women coming together. Because before everybody was like sitting separately and they could not form a group to come together and protect. And so everybody was like sitting scared at home or sometimes they had to just flee to the jungle. When I'm sharing this, I'm not talking about the cities or the towns that had protection. It was mainly the villages and the ruler areas that had no protection at all. So um, yeah, the women's group started forming from 1975 and as I was talking to Carol, the the decade of women's declaration of the UN that had a big influence on the Naga women's itself. 
and some of them also got to attend the meeting. And when this Naga women uh, started emerging, it was through the help of the uh, Indian mainland uh, activists also. They were some very few, and even they could be targeted sometimes of the human rights lawyers or activists, women activists itself, if they want to work with the uh, people in the region there. But through their uh, back channel support, they started emerging. So here, uh, from 1975, they started forming groups, and 80s, it became uh, from pockets to the wider regions, and that's how the Naga Mothers Association and Naga Women's Union Group came about. And under this, there are more than 300 women's organizations now. So here, um, whenever the militaries are about to enter the villages or the regions, uh, what they do is they they are called women with the light. Uh, they will hold this torch and come out and they will start shouting, hey, uh, if they hear of some houses about to be uh, attacked or if they started torturing somebody, they will say, they will, I, I still remember, like, they will shout, come out, like, everybody, like, come, you know, they'll start calling all the women and everybody will run out of their uh, house uh, come running with this torch like women with the light and they will gather and they will go to the regions like when it's about to be attacked or when they know that and they will go and confront uh, with the military. So here um, initially when and at night uh, I remember at, at times we could not sleep because they, we didn't know what's going to happen. So they became, uh, they keep vigil at night. They won't sleep, they will cart the village. So they will uh, shield off, they will act as a barrier. When the systems fail to protect them, they came together and at night they will stay up for holding this torch and they won't let the military enter and they will defend. So here um, they became the, instead of the security <laughs> protecting the villages, they became the cards of village, towns and cities. And they started preventing uh, rape or torture or arrest of siblings. So when civilians are arrested uh, to be tortured or to question or out of suspect, they will go to the camps, these women in thousands or hundreds, and they'll say, release the civilians to us, because that's how many civilians were killed in the process. So they'll say, they are innocent, they are not with the nationalist group, or they are not this, release the civilians to us. And sometimes they will go and threaten, like, uh, the, because there were various military camps that were set up, so they'll say, if you do not release, we are going to torture your camp. They were so brave. I don't know. I think sometimes women, when they have been through so much, they are really able to emerge. That's what I learned. Um, and here, um, they did not confront only with the military here. They started confronting the nationalist groups and various groups that emerged. They started talking with them that, you need to come to the table, you know. We are tired of this. You need to start uh, coming together and yeah, there has to be a different strategy to make things work and you, you, we don't want you to ambush and, or fight with the uh, military anymore because when you do that, it's the civilians we are suffering. So we want you to end this. So they started negotiating at all sides. And here, um, the Naka women, the difference that they could make was they could gain trust from all sides from various groups from um, the unique role they played was they never took sides of anybody that's what um, uh, that's how they came trust from uh, the civilians or from different factional groups because even the Nagas itself they got divided after 1975 when there was a failure of peace sacrament the Naga nationalist group itself also got divided and they started fighting and killing each other so here uh, when the women come together they didn't have they didn't belong to any sides. They say, we suffer together and we are one. So in the name of women, in the name of motherhood, they unite and they started campaigning in thousands and in hundreds. And I remember they will always hold, like, come out and rally for a peace march or protest. That's how uh, the movement began. And here you can see, um, this is the women with the light. Um, they will go uh, to the camps or they will 
sometimes gather like this at night to uh, when the villagers or when the towns, when the people are scared, they say, okay, we are here to protect you. You don't have to be scared. And usually they come together and they'll have a meeting and they'll strategize on what to do. And the conflict of uh, with the military and the nationalist group, it wasn't only that. The region started having a lot of ethnic problem as well. So they start living in fear with each other. So this were the times w women came about and they started negotiating, negotiating with the other ethnic groups as well. And they have tried their best to bring all the groups to you know stand together and work for peace. Um, so what I learned on the Nagas is they did not work only for the Nagas itself. They their peace building initiatives and prevention went beyond the Nagas. They worked together to keep the communities together. And when the ceasefire was went uh, to a deadlock, when the peace talks could not continue anymore, they uh, came. They went to negotiate uh, with the uh, nationalist group and with the Indian government. They came to the capital and lobby, and they said. We don't want to go back to the lives that we have had. We want you to come together and continue with the talks and dialogue. So that's how, uh, till now, the peace talks are going on. And it has been going on for 15 years. And the Naga women, they play the part breaking role in the sense of bringing the nationalist groups together when they started killing each other. They launched a campaign called Shed No More Blood. So in this campaign, um, through this campaign, they walked through the jungles when, where the nationalist groups were located, and they went to negotiate with them. And I remember a time they had to risk their life. And they were imprisoned also for some time, but they were released because they were working for peace. So um, four of the women leaders, they had to walk through the jungle of the Perma site. And they, they tried to do that uh, without announcing to the people, but I think when they went to negotiate, it was an, uh, it became a media public attention and announced all over the radios. And basically, when they came back from that uh, negotiation, they were arrested, but they were released. So when they went to the jungle and tried to negotiate, uh, they, they were told, oh, you are just bringing the news from the other side, and maybe you are just a messenger. We don't trust you. So these women, they said, we don't belong to any sides. And you know we have come to talk to you because we are tired of this bloodshed and killing. You need to listen to us. And the leader, he, he wasn't willing to meet them. But they said, until and unless you talk to us, we are not going to leave. So they stayed in that same jungle for four nights. And the, that leader, he agreed to talk on the fifth day. So um, when they kept persisting, I think uh, he couldn't hold himself anymore. So that's how uh, he um, how do we say, gave consent to talk to them. And basically, they played the role of mediation between the two groups. Uh, and after three days, the ceasefire de uh, declaration of the um, factional groups itself came about. So that's how the killing among the factional groups also got reduced a lot. And it's the women's group that brought about, but it was never mentioned. Until now, I don't think people acknowledge that they played this role, even though they played it. And um, in South Asia, actually, uh, the Naga women's group became the first women's group to be consulted at the negotiation table. So when they played this active roles, when the ceasefire was signed in 1997, the first thing they said was, we need the Naka women. So they participated in the negotiation and in the talks on strategizing how to go about. And initially, I forgot to mention, when all these women's groups started uh, their active roles, when they started taking initiatives, even the Naka started discriminating them. Can you believe it, why? <laughs> Because they are women. <laughs> what happened was when they started uh, confronting and working actively with the military, they said, oh, this women's group now, they are polluted. So the tapu, there was the name that started, you know, as, um, going along with the activists in the 70s. They said, 
if women's group they must have got corrupted with the or they must have been abused or assaulted or raped and we do not trust them anymore. So it's like even if women try their best to make things work, even the society itself sometimes because of the patriarchal nature, how they discriminated them. So even uh, for almost 20 years from 70s to 80s, um, they were they tried their best to make things work, but they never gave up. Even if the sto societies were uh, not able to see their uh, roles that they were playing, but in 1997, when the ceasefire declaration came about, they uh, everybody the society came to a realization of their importance, and that's how they could not ignore them, not to participate in the peace negotiation, and that's how they gained their space. So. Um, this is the brief um, information on what the Naga women did, and I'm sure there will be lots of questions, and I would like to elaborate more. Yeah. So we'll invite you to ask questions. Uh, you mentioned the uh, Naga women, and there was also the Naga mothers. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask you, were there different groups of women? Did they organize politically around different things? Were they in coalition? How did, how did differences among women and women's organizations get worked out? Yeah, so uh, when I say Naka Women's and uh, Union, that is like particular states, because Naka has got divided between four states. So the Naga Mothers Association are a group of women from Nagaland, and Naga Mothers uh, Union from Manipur is from the another state. So we have this different women's group that works in different areas, but they come under one umbrella. So the biggest group is the Naga Mothers Association and the Naga Women's Union Association, but they all work together. Yeah. And, um, they not only focus on the peace and conflict areas, they also advocated on their rights, on their inclusion in decision making in the traditional cultures and systems. So there's a lot of transition going on. They are trying to gain 50% of their space in the decision making because in the past, women did not participate. So depending on the region, some have been able to gain space of the 50% and some they haven't got it yet, yeah. And politically, everybody cares about the freedom, peace, and justice. So um, I don't know how to answer this word, yeah, but I would keep it that they all want peace, justice, and freedom, yeah. Mm -hmm. Jane Parpart, uh, teaching here in the uh, Global Governance and Human Security PhD program. Mm, great. Uh, I'm, I'm very interested in, in women who transgress the boundaries of what's seen as proper for women in conflicts and what happens to them afterwards. And thinking of France, a long time ago they, they were rescued by Joan of Arc. Hmm. And then after she had rescued them, she became a threat to what was seen as social order and they, they burned her at the stake. Mm -hmm. It seems to me this issue of what happens to women who, in a crisis, take on leadership roles that are not normally associated with women, mm -hmm. it seems to me that they are often regarded in once peace is achieved or some kind of order mm -hmm. as, as a threat to, to normality. And that means what is it ever is imagined to be the normal gender relations right, that right. should be true if peace was out. Mm -hmm. has, what has happened to these women? Have they been, have they gone back to being more traditional women? Have they been able to actually change things for women? I'm, I'm very interested yeah, that you started uh, talking about that, so just right, to right. elaborate a little more on that. Sure, yeah, th that's a very good question. 
I, when you say peace, I won't say that peace has really reached the region of the Nagas. It's very much negative peace. It's not positive peace yet. So the women are still very much actively involved. Um, there is a forum called Nagas Forum for Reconciliation and Peace. And here women are still spearheading. And when I compare with the past and how the things are working right now, I should say that the Naga women have gained a lot of space for the younger generation like me to have that space and role because men have come to a realization obviously there's still like a lot of uh, the patriarchal kind of nature still exists that relates with customary laws and uh, systems but the way the nature how the society is about to transition and the way it's going forward I see that there has been a lot of space created by the women itself but obviously after post-conflict setting when peace is achieved a lot of women goes back to their home and they do not have a space since we haven't reached to that stage yet I'm not able to say it because they are very much still actively involved but we'll make sure that they do not go back <laughs> and sit at home <laughs> yeah um, they should but here um, are taking place at the Indian government level I haven't seen any Indian uh, women participating at the talks yeah so that's that plays a bit of the role but on the Naga side actually I think there has been a woman that once sat at the talks with the Indian government itself so yeah yeah Hi, I'm Maya and I'm um, a graduate student at Clark University. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more about what it was like for the Naga women to go to the peace negotiation table and have those experiences evolved over time in any particular directions. Um, in this, um, before coming to the, the role that Naga women played to bring about peace, the, when the consultation was taking place, they realized that without the presence of the women, the groups will not be able to come together because they were the main group that negotiated both the sides. And they said, hey, they were the one like a bridge between the two. So they wanted the women to be there when the first negotiation started. So in a way, um, I, sh I would say that uh, out of the need, they were called and they have been there. It wasn't like hey, women did not say, we need to be there and we need the space, but it was the realization of the group itself that we need these women on the table. Because obviously, according to the experience of <laughs> working with women or men sometimes, when only men sit at the table, they start pointing finger at each other and argument starts. So oftentimes women have been the bridge that plays the role of the peace and I've seen that uh, emerging in Naga's women's way of functioning. Yeah and recently um, we had a talk in our school actually and according to the speaker's experience as well what he told me was um, the men started uh, <laughs> fighting and pointing fingers at each other and they were not able to come to a conclusion. So w one of our uh, women activists, she stood up and she just started shouting in the room, <laughs> you need to start talking seriously with each other. We are tired of this and you need to listen to us. So I think then everybody calm down <laughs> and listen. So somehow in a way, I think they have been able to, you know, make their point across. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, um, I'm Kelly Reddy from Brandeis University. Mm -hmm. um, I have like a lot of questions, but let me just do sure. the yeah. first one. I'll try and combine a few of them together. Oh, the first thing is, I think that we, um, I think that we need to bring Naga women to the U.S. Congress, <laughs> get them to uh, bring those men together there. They, they sound like they have to, or they need to teach us their, those skills. Um, but I'd want you had talked about the um, the 
villages and how all the violence was going on in the villages but not in the cities so I'm wondering like how much uh, how much urban women or city women were involved in these process how much they got involved and then I also want to ask you to talk a little bit about the women who were in the nationalist group and I, I would think that that's probably the group that was militia that was armed group and if they there were any women who took leadership roles in the armed movements uh, women nationalists and the other was the urban oh yeah urban, urban. Here when I say uh, the Nakas uh, at the villages suffered the most, most of the Naka areas it's not, we do not have big cities. It's only one of the state like called Nakaland that has the city. And the other three states where the Nakas were merged with the other groups, most of the cities were not located in the Naka areas. It, uh, it, it is somewhere with the other communities that has access to the city. So here, um, when, if I look at the Nagas itself, most of the population were in the past mostly in like towns or villages, not many were in cities. But even if it's like towns, um, the Nagas did not have any control. So even they were the victims. But when um, the ambush or when the fighting takes place, it mostly happens like in the villages, nearby the villages, and it's much, I think, easier for the military to go where there's no protection. But I uh, remember like when I was in school in towns, it was similar as well, even though, but there we had police but police had no power, the military is over them. That's how I mentioned the incident when they started shooting at each other because they were tired. <laughs> and even the government, few of the Naga uh, leaders who were even at the government itself, when the incident takes place, they were tortured and some were even killed. So basically, yeah, everybody was in a similar situation. And in regard to women nationalists, I would be a bit careful as a scholar about calling them as militia. I would call them as a nationalist, yeah. And when uh, you want to know about them on... I want to know about women's role in the nationalism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So here, uh, there are 30% of women in the nationalist group itself, and most of these women, um, they also face discrimination. Yeah, it's a men's domain, and initially there were, I think, said like, you know, you should be in the women's domain, like even if they are in fighting in the jungle, like you should be in the women's domain, like even. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Even in that realm itself, they were. But I think um, a lot of awareness has been created, but it's not perfect yet. Yeah, and they, as I mentioned, um, one of the women leaders, she participated. Uh, took, uh, she participated actually in the negotiation itself in the peace talks. So somehow they have that space. Yeah, but I won't say it's perfect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hi, my name is Om. Um, I'm an intern here. I'm curious about the actual mechanism that was used for coordination. Sounds like it's a lot of like neighbor to neighbor word of mouth. Yeah. Um, but as we're going forward, I'm sure you're, you know, you know we're going to be using more and more electronic means. So is that starting to come into the coordination across borders and between towns and communities? of uh, coordination, which angle are you wanting? I mean, just like informal gatherings, spreading news with one another, saying we're going to collect here, this is what's happening, so everybody's mm -hmm, sort of like moves mm -hmm, over that way. But mm -hmm. you can tell, like, being able to communicate easily over a border changes the dynamic of how quickly right, you can right, people right, together. Right. They're very effective, so it seems like that'd be a really yeah. useful thing. Yeah, actually what has happened was uh, from 50s till the ceasefire was signed, uh, the region was totally Nobody had access, and the 
tourists, I think the permit, the restricted uh, permit was removed only in 2000 then. And if anybody still wants to go in, you have to, uh, till 2000 then, like everybody has to take permission. So basically um, it was controlled and none of the medias could have a coverage. Even if lots of killings were take place, even in the mainstream media itself, it doesn't allow to be reached or it, it wasn't allowed to be covered. So now it's opening up, but still it's, um, I would say that we do not have much of the media access or resources are still lacking in that behind. Yeah. Phones are accessible, but uh, it's monitored. Yeah. Yeah. Until now, I some of the scholars and activists are watched. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not like completely free. <laughs> Yeah. But uh, since it has been opened open up in 2010, I'm sure there is a lot of space and room for coordination and improvement. Yeah. You'd mentioned a little bit about other ethnic conflicts around mm -hmm. that region. Mm -hmm. Had you heard about similar women's movements within those different ethnic groups? Yeah, um, in the region actually the women's group started from Naga but it spread across other groups. So basically, I don't want to blame men but I think sometimes I have to. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So in this ethnic conflict as well, like you know, uh, most often times it has been men that starts to fight and kill, and it will be the women's group. You know, obviously when somebody is killed, they also get affected, but they have tried their best to come together and work together, and they have been able to achieve that in the process, and and still they are working towards it. Yeah, and here when we say ethnic conflict, it. It didn't emerge from the region itself. There were lots of politics from the high level that played out. And when the communities were just, palm trees just merged and people were merged, you know, obviously there has to be a fight for the resource, for the land, for everything. So, yeah. Um. Could you talk about the Shed No Blood campaign? Mm -hmm. Could you talk about it a little bit more? <laughs> sure. <laughs> so here, um, how the Shed No More Blood campaign came about um, in 1975. That was the first time actually the Nagas, uh, one of, it became a part of the Union of India, some of the border areas. Before that, Nagas, they remained with their uh, independence declaration from the British times. So uh, when this nationalist group started um, organizing in 1975, the peace still signing took place without um, much consultation with the population and not many leaders of the nationalist group were involved itself. So when this uh, peace still was signed, it's an accord that was signed in 1975. Indian government sort of carved out some of the land like as for the Nagas and leaving out the majority of the population and other Nagas that live in Parma or in the India itself. So here um, they started uh, after some of the groups, uh, some of few of the leaders signed the deal. So who did not agree with that deal came about uh, another two groups. And here now they started pointing fingers at each other, like who did this deal and you know, who, who is responsible for this, but it did not end there. It went towards the community and they started killing each other as well. And some of the <laughs> Indian government were involved in it itself. So in this, um, Nagas, apart from the military now, Nagas were not safe with each other. So the Naga, um, 
mothers and women's group, they came together and they said, we need to stop this bloodshed because they are all our sons, you know, and our daughters, and they need to stop killing each other. So they launched this campaign in 1980s, and it became one of the champion uh, in their cause in stopping the violence, and that's how, through their initiative, the killing of each other stopped. Yeah. And it was this that uh, I mentioned, uh, through this initiative that they went to the jungle to negotiate. Yeah, and when I forgot to mention, when they came back from the jungle after um, uh, negotiating with them, they were arrested by the Indian military at the border. So they said, where did you go? <laughs> they went towards Parma and you're not supposed to, you know, so where did you go and what did you guys do? So one of the women leaders, she took out a badge and she said, this is for you. And in that patch, it was written, shed no more blood. So it was for them as well. So they, and they told them that we are for peace. You know, we're tired of all this violence. So they were released after that, yeah. Until now, uh, it's going on, the initiatives. Um, I'm curious also, in that situation, everybody knows the stories and the folklore in the group, mm -hmm. how do they feel about that? Do they, they have a sense of power? And they feel really, you know, has it, has it had an effect that's very positive? It seems like it would, but I'm just curious. Uh, it's powerful, the folk uh, lores and the folk tales of how our forefathers were and how our cultures and traditions were. And most of the struggle also comes from the awareness of how they were very different from the people that tries to occupy them itself. So in a way, it plays a very important role. And still, uh, there is so much of um, attachment of the younger generation towards the their history in itself. Yeah. And from 1950s to till 80s, any mat written materials or anything that has to do with Nagas were not allowed to exist. I forgot to mention, yeah. It was when all the houses were searched and if there's anything that writes about the Nagas, if you are possessing some materials, you'll be tortured or you'll be taken away. So a lot of um, the Naga culture or the life itself was destroyed in a way. Yeah, and now the younger generations are trying to now trace back but most of our older generations have died also so but they're trying to trace back yeah yeah <laughs> um, I'm at, as I know you know when women organize against war there are a variety of um, sort of ideological bases on which they do it and mm -hmm. some women's organizations really rely on identities of mothers and saying you know we do this because of our you know our husbands and our children and as as mothers we need to protect them mm -hmm. others um, not so much relying on the identity of mother but sometimes relying on ideas about women that are you know, women are more peaceful etc cetera, etc cetera. and sometimes women's organizations don't rely on those kinds of ideas so I'm wondering what you could tell us about the kind of uh, ideological basis for organizing amongst women in the conflict uh, they're according to the life experiences that they have had um, their first ideology I should say is freedom, peace, and justice for all. That's their main uh, ideology that is space. And when we say mothers, like, it somehow plays a unique role in itself. And I think having the name of the motherhood to unite and work on it, people are able to listen to them more. They can point their fingers to the fighters and say hey you are all my sons you need to listen to me and according to the actually um, Naka cultures women 
have had before the military occupation in the oral tradition times like the past, Naga women played actually a very important role. They were called the peacemaker. Uh, it's called Pukrela in the different uh, in our dialect. So here in times, um, uh, the, when the Naga uh, villages or the clans, when they fight with each other, the women, uh, Nagas cannot marry within the same clan. So yeah, when she gets married with another clan, and if that clan and her clan starts fighting, she can go in between and she has to stay stop, stop fighting, and man has to listen. If not, they say the curse comes on them. So in the past, they have played that unique role. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's how I think the from 70s also, they relying back on that kind of initiatives. That's how they emerge again, but yeah, it was stopped for a while. And please repeat if I haven't answered it yet. I want to ask a question. I have a question I want to ask Singmila that is not about the Naga conflict. So if anybody has a Naga conflict question other to ask, go ahead and ask it before I <laughs> I'm just curious, um, actually. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I'm Onkana. I'm not a student anywhere. I actually heard about this through a friend, uh -huh. um, a journalist who's visiting, also on a scholarship to, uh, to the U.S., oh, as he's from Ohom. Oh. I'm also from Ohom, so I'm very glad to see this, see you here talking oh. about this. Thank you. Because outside of India or outside of the Northeast, not many people know about this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> my question is, um, how do you identify yourself as Indian or Naga? So when people ask you, do you say, I'm from India or I'm from Naga? Uh, this, this is, is something a, I've been fighting myself. So yeah, I'm yeah. Another <laughs> woman uh, from the Northeast. How mm -hmm, do you mm -hmm. I think uh, as a woman and it's a culture that I was born and I'm very proud of being a Naga itself. So first, it's not the first thing that I say Naga. I think now my, after staying in the States, I have transitioned into more of like the women activists or <laughs> the scholar trying to write about uh, peace and conflict. Um, I think what I care more about is what happens in the region and the countries itself. And sometimes it's very hard to associate uh, India itself because of the way, I'm sure you must have also experienced everything that you have been through in the region itself. The way the um, government has played against the people and the lives that you had to suffer through, sometimes it's very hard to you know, say, yes, this is what I'm proud of. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I, I say I'm from India. I don't say I'm from Nagaland. <laughs> but since I look different, everybody will be like, how come? How, how are you from India? So that's how I start explaining, OK, I'm a Naga, and this happened, yeah. OK, so here's my question. Um, since you have spent a huge amount of time in women's civil society organizations and know a lot about the, you know, very hard work that these organizations do yeah. locally. And now you have spent all this time in the Washington area and you have seen the 1325 National Action Plan that's come out from the U.S. government mm -hmm. and you've seen the kind of the way it brings women into thinking, and women's organizations, into thinking about everything from actually military operations mm -hmm. to security sector reform. Um, I'm wondering, I'd like to hear something about your thoughts about the ways in which women's civil society organizations from conflict-affected areas appear in this policy discourse that's going on in the U.S. around 1325 mm -hmm. and 
U.S. Uh, national action action plan and right, policy? Right. Uh, the U.S. national action plan or 1325 in general, I would say it has been very powerful in a way. But we also have to be very careful when we focus on the aspects of security. Because um, as I mentioned about how the people have suffered, how did it come about? It's in the name of security. And in the name of security, when countries uh, frame laws and policies, it works against um, certain groups or certain regions. And I think we have to be very careful how do we define security in itself. Whose security are we talking about? And when I frame uh, certain things or when I work on certain particular issues, whose security is it going to be affected? And when we compare and see most of the conflicts that has taken place, uh, the state government itself has been a major player in persecuting the people of certain groups, certain regions, or certain areas. So I think we have to be very careful enough in generalizing the term of security. and. Rather than coming together, okay, we need, uh, we need to unite in the name of terrorism, in the name of security. I think we have to be uh, very careful enough in defining, okay, which area, which teams, and how careful should we be in collaborating or working together. Okay, maybe U.S. government uh, might have a good security and maybe they do not persecute the local population or the civilians the way it has been happening in most conflict affected areas and if the u.s government says oh now we need to unite with all the countries because we have to fight for security um the people that has suffered through will view it as like cooptation like it's a kind of sold out of what they are fighting for what the women's group or many um, civil society has been advocating for food. It's for the security of all. It can't be just for the security of few. And I think uh, we have to be very careful enough in looking at the aspects of terrorism and the security in itself. And I fear that um, if we are not careful enough, most of the work that has been done by the civil society or the women's group can be sold out easily. So I think we have to be very careful in how we are going to operate in these terms. Yeah. Okay, so if you, like me, get most of your news from the US media, you probably knew as little about the Indonaga conflict as I did, and, and, and even less about the extraordinary role that women have played in bringing peace to the region. So if that's the case, please join me in thanking Cindy for this wonderful. No. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me.